So welcome everybody. This is SharePoint, a SharePoint Panel Practices special interest group around the PMP Site Score and PMP PowerShell, and this is the April fifth, twenty seventeen edition. Uh, we'll probably get a lot of people joining a few minutes late. Uh, that always happens, and that's absolutely fine. We do have quite a few uh, core team members in a call as well, but half of the team is either on vacation or traveling or whatever, so you won't see some of the familiar faces today. But that, well, we have Frank and Patrick and Paolo in a call as well. So uh, today, well, before we actually go there, I should actually drop the slide. Just quickly explaining SharePoint PMP. Uh, SharePoint PMP is a community-driven initiative coordinated by the SharePoint Engineering, and we provide code samples, guidance documentations, community calls. Um, we have the special interest groups, and the themes are in SharePoint Framework, SharePoint Add-ins, Microsoft Graph, and Office 365 development in general, AKMS, SPPNP, or SharePoint PMP. Uh, both uh, AKMS addresses are working. That drives you or lands you to a single page in dev.office.com from where you can actually find what's happening. And I was just checking the page though, uh, I haven't updated that for a while, so it's slightly lacking behind of all of our actions, so I needed to find some time to go and update that uh, pretty soon. Anyway, for today, uh, this is the special interest group for uh, BMP uh, CSUM Core and BMP PowerShell and BMP Provisioning Engine. Um, so we kind of quickly have a look on the BMP March uh, usage. Uh, that's one slide, so that's not going to take too long. Uh, just to show you that you might you are not alone if you're using the BMP provisioning as an example, and, and then having a look on the on the open source uh, activities. Then we will talk about uh, one slide around the provisioning schema. So if you have any suggestions what we should be adding to the provisioning schema, what is missing, we would like to get all of those uh, collected. So we're looking into starting development of a new schema version. Uh, uh, actually, after this Friday, this Friday will be the April master merge. So after that one, we will start actually implementing a new schema version. Uh, the schema provisioning schema is the one which defines what elements and capabilities are defined uh, or available in the PMP provisioning engine. So the schema is always developed first, and then we start developing the support for that in the engine. Um, there's quite a few items already on the list, uh, what we need to add there, but a lot of them are more or less kind of, a, how would I put it, polishing uh, additional things like uh, additional settings in the list and so on. In overall, I would estimate that we are in a 90-95% uh, of the coverage of CSUM in general uh, with the BMP provisioning engine, which is pretty cool, so it's pretty complete already. Uh, but for the previous game version, was, I think it was released actually uh, May last year. So it's about time that we're adding some additional capabilities to it. And one of the things, for example, will be the support for the modern pages and modern uh, light, uh, web parts to be defined on the modern pages as well. So that's being uh, one of the high priority asks uh, what people are having. Now, uh, after that, we'll have a quick look on, on the provisioning engine refactoring. So Paolo is going to do that. Uh, so this is coming not in the April re release. This is coming in the May release. We It is actually complete, uh, but it was feature complete uh, this week. And since the master merge is on Friday, we didn't, we didn't want to risk it. Um, the whole point of that provisioning engine refactoring is that the engine would be A, more reliable, B, more easily maintainable, and C, uh, people would be, well, other than Paolo, would be able to actually help us in certain uh, areas. Uh, and it seems to be looking pretty cool. So um, we can much faster implement additional capabilities in the future for the PMP provisioning engine, do the refactoring work, which is now completed. Uh, and then the second demo uh, is a, a kind of a quick uh, walkthrough on how you can take advantage uh, of the of the Microsoft Flow, Azure Functions, and BMP PowerShell to provision to create yourself a self-service modern site provisioning solution in 10 minutes. And this sounds weird, but it's actually possible. And I was, to be honest, I was slightly shocked uh, when I walked this through uh, yesterday, just for a demo perspective. Um, it is pretty cool. Obviously, it's not a fully com feature complete after 10 minutes, but it gives you the direction where we are heading also from a flow and Azure Functions perspective. And then using the BMP PowerShell in Azure Functions is super easy. We had a nice demos around that one from John Liu uh, two weeks ago. Uh, humongous amount of demos, actually. Uh, and so if you missed that, you probably want to go and have a look on the recording from the YouTube channel. And then we should have plenty of time for the Q&A. Uh, so that should be there. 
Good. Uh, let's actually move on. So quick uh, stats on the BMP March usage, and Nigel will come back on the on the future schema in a second. So this is just the one slide. I didn't we didn't don't want to spend too much time on the metrics. Uh, the whole point of this one is that um, you sh should feel safe of not being the only one being involved within the BMP initiative or using the BMP provisioning engine as an example. So we did have uh, 4,647 unique tenants using the BMP uh, C core component or PowerShell or BMP JS core uh, for that matter uh, in the SharePoint Online. Uh, we did have a 1.8 billion HTTP requests uh, last month as well, which is a massive number. It seems to be that we are hitting the 2 billion limit uh, in April. We'll see if we get there. Uh, but the growth, uh, based on the growth, uh, we actually should get there pretty easily. Uh, if we're hitting, let's say, increasing 1.8 billion plus 15%, uh, which is the monthly growth or has been, and that's being pessimistic, um, then it will, should be 2 billion requests uh, in April. We had uh, 24,000 unique visitors in GitHub uh, for a reason or another. Uh, we're not actually quite 100% sure why. Uh, this is actually leaping quite fast forward as well, uh, which is obviously good. Uh, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. It's absolutely a great thing. Uh, but we don't know where the inc uh, massive increase is, why the massive increase is happening. It might be that more and more people are kind of uh, looking into moving SharePoint online and starting to learn uh, the, the modern ways of doing customizations. Um, views uh, are in 136,000 in GitHub uh, across all of the BMP repos, and this includes the SharePoint, uh, SharePoint repositories as well. The most used capability uh, is the provisioning engine. It was used in 1,290 tenants during March, uh, so we actually finally jumped over the 1,000 tenant limit, which is pretty cool, uh, and the increase was pretty significant, so uh, roughly 25% increase from uh, last, uh, last uh, month. Um, top countries based on tenants, no movement there. Uh, so the number of tenants, uh, top countries based on HTTP requests. Uh, actually, UK dropped from the top five list, uh, and then Netherlands, uh, Denmark remained the same. Netherlands jumped on second, and uh, there's some small uh, movement over there as well. So UK actually dropped to sixth, but uh, that's pretty typical. Uh, it happens. They say they be a request, let's say, competition, in quotes. Uh, we can see when some customers are doing, let's say, content migration, and they utilize the BMP to provision sites uh, in a, with certain content types and fields and, and uh, let's say, lists, which is relatively typical use case. Uh, that always increases the usage uh, in the countries as well. So in last month, uh, in February, there was quite a few or few migration cases ongoing uh, in the UK, uh, but last month uh, there was so the UK went slightly down from an HTTP request uh, perspective. Um, cool. Uh, I'm looking into Ralph's question. It's a limit or a milestone. I missed the, the context on that one, but that's fine. Uh, but I think that's enough for the for the metrics. But it, things are looking pretty uh, darn uh, good uh, from a usage perspective, and obviously these are good things for us as well. Because we even in, in SharePoint engineering, but I mean actual engineering as well. Uh, so we're looking into using the BMP in the future as well. And the fact that people are using the BMP initiative helps us on making a case uh, for our uh, management level as well. Good. Moving on on things. So uh, quickly, uh, to, let's talk about the provisioning schema. Uh, and let's talk about uh, the what are we planning to do on there. I'm going to... I mute some people because because I found some uh, background noise on there, but that's fine. So we're planning to start building the new uh, schema. Uh, and there's a one comment which I want to trans. Is the 2 million SADB request a limit or a milestone? It's 2 billion, not 2 million. Uh, it is a, a, a milestone. And it's 2 billion, not 2 million. Uh, so pretty big difference over there as well. Anyway, on the provisioning schema, so plant update. So obviously we want to add, uh, yes, indeed. Um, we want to add support for the modern uh, capabilities. So essentially having a, a support for provisioning modern pages and provisioning client-side web parts on the pages. Uh, this includes also custom web parts if they are being present and available within a site. Right now in the in SharePoint framework side, uh, we don't have an API or in the adding model. We don't have an APIs to automatically uh, automatically add 
uh, add-in or SharePoint framework solution to the sites. Uh, so that kind of um, means that you cannot provision custom client-side web parts on a basis. So theoretically, yes, in practice, that's pretty difficult right now. We're looking into having that capability support there, though, because we in the SharePoint engineering are looking into implementing those APIs, which will enable you a capability to install add-ins and SharePoint framework solution to the sites. So that's coming up, that's in the roadmap for us in the SharePoint engineering side. And then the PMP initiative together with the community will implement that support in the, in the engine side. Uh, there's already a uh, pull request uh, around uh, the publishing page provisioning. So how to actually get publishing pages provisioned as part of the engine, because people tend to have some level of a content in a template as well. Uh, there's some term level handling improvement. That's a pull request also waiting already in the in the provisioning schema repo uh, related on pin, ster pin net terms and reuse terms uh, capabilities in the term store. Then we want to actually have a capability to associate webhooks for now initially in the, the list level, which is the only level where the webhooks are being supported. But again, on the webhooks, we're looking into enabling webhooks on other levels as well. So for example, list created event uh, and site created event and so on. So whenever I'm in this kind of a dual hat position, so let me put my SharePoint engineering hat on. Whenever we in SharePoint engineering will implement webhooks for uh, these additional capabilities, then those will be implemented also uh, the, the BMB provisioning engine. Uh, and also looking into enabling CDN in libraries automatically, That's that would be a simple setting probably in the list element uh, where you define that, hey, I want CDN to be enabled in this library automatically. And oh, then and forwarded to an automatic voice message system, nine, okay. eight, nine, eight. <laughs> Somebody's going to have a pretty long uh, message uh, if this is getting recorded there. Cool. So looking into enabling the CDN uh, automatically as part of the template. So uh, essentially what it means is that we will uh, add an automatically a CDN origin pointing to the library is if that has been defined uh, in the list level. Uh, and then there's a uh, then there is a additional set of things like web part connections, uh, support for external lists, uh, which uh, these are things which have been such suggested uh, as a things what we should be looking into. Web part connections, it's kind of understandable. It's a classic scenario. Not that many people are actually using web part connections, um, and it's because this would be classic web part connections. Um, we can look into that one. I'm not sure uh, if. That's a super, super viable solution, uh, but more than happy to have a feedback uh, and input on that one. Support for external lists, theoretically doable. In practice, obviously, this would have a dependency on the BCS definitions being on a tenant. Um, and the usage of, of external lists is pretty low as well overall. Uh, so we're not 100% sure if we want to invest on that. Let's see if we can actually figure out that one relatively fast. Uh, IRM setting support for the list, that would actually make a lot of sense. Uh, and that would actually be pretty good uh, on, on getting it there because there's an API to do uh, to make that happen. Support for site scope content types and templates. Now, this is an interesting discussion. Um, this is, how would I put it? Uh, this is controversial discussion. In practice, it is actually a horrible practice and horrible model to create site-specific content types. In the real world, it is absolutely recommended to create content types always on the site collection route and then uh, reference them from the root of the site collection. So your content types would be site collection scoped. The reason for that one is that whenever you need to update those content type instances, you would be able to then update them in a root site and then push down to the charts. Now, if you would create your content types in a site level, you cannot actually have that centralized control, which means that you would have to scan through sites, you would have to check the libraries, you would have to check all of the content types and all of that. And that's really the reason why we originally didn't have this support uh, within the engine. Now, it has been asked quite a few times, and what we were thinking within the core team is that, okay, no, if people want to do that, even though it is not a good practice, it's not on us to make that decision. Uh, so let's actually enable that capability uh, even though it might have implications. So we're not going to actually limit 
uh, people for doing that, uh, which was the original idea. Uh, image renditions, pretty cool thing to automate as well, should, and that's pretty easily doable. It's a, uh, essentially a list in the in the site, in the publishing site, Dave formatting uh, applied to the uh, site level, and then additional list settings like no crawl and all of that. So uh, that's kind of the high level thinking on this one. Uh, there is a URL on the slide, which is pointing to the PMP provision in schema issue lists, uh, which would be the location actually to give us feedback and give us suggestions. Hey, I want to have this item. I'm missing this one. Um, and then there, were, there was a question from Paul around, can we actually somehow vote on these items? Um, the only way I can actually quickly think of a process is that you would actually do reactions in the issue list. So you would actually do a thumbs up, uh, in, uh, in, thumbs up uh, in the issue list for the issues, and that would be probably the easiest way to do that. Good. Um, I'm quickly going to scan some of the comments. Um, uh, so there's a comment related on about time for the RM settings. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, I wouldn't say about time seems negative. It, all, of, all of the work that we're doing is dependent on the contributions from a community. So uh, if somebody needs something, uh, we need to uh, obviously build on that together. So that's more than, uh, but it's fine. It's good, it's good to get it included. Uh, External list in the additional list settings. Oops, I'm just quickly scanning through the iron window. Uh, all his accessories will be used up. Okay, that's a generalized comment. Any expected time frame for the ability to install add-ins on the sites programmatically? Now we're looking into that one to ha happen definitely during this calendar year. Uh, it is already in specs. Uh, it's just a matter of getting the, the functionality uh, queued up in our engineering and prioritized in the engineering stack. Um, it is a really common classic requirement, uh, so it will be pretty most likely pretty fastly implemented uh, and available relatively soon um, and in this it isn't actually too difficult thing to implement uh, we also know that right now people are using http post to do that uh, http post patterns uh, to actually automate those steps but we want to have that automatically and natively within a product um, dun, 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 dun. Update search, any update, ability to update the search schema. We do have an update on the search settings in the site collection level. Uh, so we are actually exporting the search, set, search settings in the site collection level. Not sure if that's sufficient. Uh, if it's a tenant level configuration, then that gets much more complicated because this, the templates are always in the site or, or site collection level. Uh, WebPod connection not used since 2007. I'm actually with you there, Robert. <laughs> Me neither. Um, dun, 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 dun. Just scanning through quickly the comments. Dun, dun, dun. How would you create a look at field in a subsite? That's the classic subsite uh, discussion. Now, the, the sorry, the lookup field discussion. Now, we do support lookup fields in a single site uh, already. You are able to create them in a single site. Now, the problem or the challenge is that whenever we, uh, if we want to have additional support, like creating lists in the root side of the site collection and then do a lookup on those, then we need to jump across the sites and that's always gets uh, slightly more complicated, but we'll, we'll have a look on that one as well. Uh, and I think that's it from the comments. Um, would it be possible to create a parameter to set the document set view? That would be CSAM level chains, most likely, because I don't think we support that in the CSAM right now. Uh, we can absolutely have a look on that. I would, Paul, on that comment, I would suggest that you'll add an issue list, issue to the issue list. What we're planning to do, like mentioned, we will go through the issue list in the PMP provisioning schema and collect all of the uh, essentially all of the input and then have a look on which of them we can implement uh, and which of them we will actually define in the schema and then after that we'll implement uh, all of them in the engine as well. But I think after this this cycle of development, um, we are in a really, really high percentage uh, of coverage related on uh, on the SharePoint capabilities. So it, I'm looking forward to actually getting this one done because after that, there isn't that many things what people are asking, which 
you can even do it using remote uh, APIs. Good. Cool. I scanned through the, the comments. Let's actually move down on the slides because I know uh, now that Paolo needs to leave slightly early today, do a family things, and it's family always first um, before anything else. So, Paolo, let's actually flip on the PMP provisioning engine refactoring update just to quickly explain what we've been doing uh, and then uh, high level discussion on that one and then we move on. Okay, thank you, Visa. So let me start sharing my screen, and please let me know when you uh, when you will see it. Absolutely. So and has to comment share. on Paul. Yes, PMP is absolutely family. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I I I will get the controller. So yep. okay, I stole the stage. Loading. You always do and, that. Yeah, to... yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, I got it. I got it. Okay, good. So uh, we will start uh, with a brief explanation of the context and of the requirements that uh, uh, made us make the choice to uh, do a, a kind of a huge refactoring of the uh, serialization engine uh, in the provisioning engine of PMP. And then I will show you just a quick demo of the new refactored engine running. So I will not dig into the details of the code this time as like as I did uh, uh, some weeks uh, ago, uh, but I will just show you that it works uh, and mainly how it works. So uh, first of all, uh, let me try to uh, identify the context. So you know that whenever we uh, handle a provisioning template with the provisioning engine, the template uh, is based uh, on a, a domain model object complex object in memory, which defines uh, uh, the structure of all of the entities, all of the items that we will uh, provision or that we will extract uh, from the source uh, uh, site. So, uh, for example, we have property bags, we have site fields, we have content types, lists, and so on, uh, uh, so forth. And for example, when we uh, think about the collection of lists, we have a collection of list instance objects, which uh, do exist both at the domain model level in uh, uh, the complex in-memory representation of the provisioning template that we have, as well as in the XML schema or in the JSON schema or in the XML file stored inside a .pmp file that we have. And most likely you know that from a PMP provisioning engine perspective, we are independent from the physical persistent storage and from the physical representation of the provisioning template on the wire, on the disk. But uh, on the other side, uh, you know that one of the most used uh, uh, serialization format that we uh, uh, are used to use in PMP in the provisioning engine is the XML-based uh, format. So, for example, if you think about this hierarchy of objects in memory, they map to, a, uh, to an XML representation which is based on a specific XML schema. Well, in order to uh, do that, uh, we released as Vesa already told you in the previous minutes, on a, a set of uh, uh, schema, XML schemas that uh, on, uh, define all of the available capabilities step by step uh, uh, based on the uh, release cycles that we had uh, in PMP. So for example, we start in March 2015, and right now we are in May 2016, which is the latest version that we have uh, uh, from an XML schema perspective. And as you can see, the first three uh, versions, the uh, oldest ones uh, are already obsolete and you shouldn't use them anymore. Uh, what does that mean? Well, if you are still using them, uh as you can see, they still work from a PMP provisioning engine perspective. But uh, sooner or later, maybe we will uh, end supporting those uh, versions, uh, not only from a coding perspective, but also from a functionality perspective, because we cannot uh, uh, make it possible to have uh, the engine able to handle every single version uh, of the schema. So uh, right now, the main version are the uh, one from 2015-12 and 2015 
2016-05 and the upcoming next one, which will be most likely the May 2017. Uh, that means that right now those are the uh, main uh, uh, versions that we have and we have an upcoming one uh, which will include uh, uh, most of the uh, capabilities that uh, Visa showed you uh, just a few seconds ago. Under the cover, whenever the provisioning engine uh, needs to read or write uh, a provisioning template from in-memory to the file system or to the persistent storage and back from the persistent storage to the in-memory representation, we use uh, a, uh, an engine based on a, a formatter object, which is basically a, a very complex complex uh, uh, class uh, which handles the reading and the writing of the uh, XML file into memory or from the memory to the uh, persistence repository. So let's say we have this XML file on the uh, persistent storage by using a formatter, for example, the one for the schema 2016-05, we simply read the XML and we did it within a unique, uh, I would say really complex and uh, long, uh, from a code perspective, long class, we do all of the handling in order to read the XML and to create the in-memory representation of the uh, domain model object of the provisioning template in memory. At the same time, and likewise, whenever we need to store to save the provisioning template, we can go backward. So we can use the same formatter, which will have another method, uh, again, a long one, to go through all of the uh, objects in memory and to save the XML um, file onto the persistent storage. Of course, it works. It works, and as you saw, uh, thousands of companies and with billions of requests uh, use this uh, technique. However, from a maintenance perspective, uh, from an, uh, a management perspective, it is not that easy to uh, um, to support new requests or new schema versions. Because right now, with the current uh, version of the uh, formatters uh, engine, whenever we have a new schema, we have to write almost from scratch a new formatter, which is a huge uh, task to do. So. In order to improve the quality of the engine and to be faster in adopting new versions of the schema if needed, we replace the idea of uh, having a formatter for every single schema version with the idea of having a serializer for each and every schema version, which looks like exactly the same as before, but it is not. In fact, every serializer is made of a bunch of uh, little modules which are still called serializer and which target every single uh, main object in the provisioning template. So if in the formatter approach, which is the current one in production right now, we have a unique uh, huge class which will handle the serialization and deserialization of the provisioning template for any specific schema version. With the new serializer based model, yes, we still have a serializer uh, class, but this class will rely on a bunch of uh, uh, modular uh, components, which are those uh, uh, serializers like the Adins one, the Compose Look one, and so on and so forth. And every single serializer will simply handle the reading and writing of a specific object from the XML source, being able to handle multiple versions of the schema. So using this technique, we will be able to reuse uh, most of the code we wrote during this refactoring, and we will be able to uh, release for every new schema version just the delta, so just the differences that will be uh, implemented in a new schema, and we will not need to rewrite every single time from scratch the entire serializer for every single new schema version, which is the main difference and key difference of the new refactoring uh, that we did. Moreover, from an architectural perspective, the serializers uh, do provide the capability to define a sequence while we deserialize or while we serialize the content. So we can play around the uh, components, defining a sequence uh, which will be the order of uh, application of all of the uh, serializers within the pipeline while serializing or deserializing a template. 
And last but not least, every single component, every single serializer will have, uh, uh, through an attribute-based uh, uh, programming technique, uh, will have an information about the minimal supported schema version. So we will be able to reuse the same serializer for multiple schema versions as long as uh, the a uh, new schema does not completely rewrite the, uh, uh, the schema of the search uh, template object. So, for example, if in the next version of the schema we will update the content types, for example, adding a few new attributes to the XML structure, we will be able to reuse exactly the same content type serializer object without having the need to write a new one just because we added a few properties, which is really cool because, as I told you, this will improve Improve, greatly improve uh, our, uh, let me say, time to market, even if we don't sell anything, but we will be faster in adopting new capabilities and new functionalities. So, uh, from a, 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 again, from an architectural perspective, the new serializers are fully backward compatible with the old school, and which is the current one, for matter model. So, uh, from outside, anybody will notice anything, but it will be a deep change inside the heart of the engine, which again will be hidden uh, from outside, but still really useful from a development perspective and from a project management perspective. The new approach is fully object-oriented, so it will be much more oriented on the domain model level approach instead of relying on the low level XML format. And because it is modular, we can do better testing. So for example, we created for most of the serializer that we created also a bunch of unit tests so that we can better test and improve the quality of the resulting code. It is based from an inner perspective still on the XML serializer engine, the uh, old school and well-known XML serializer, which still works in .NET pretty well, and a bunch of reflection, .NET reflection, which will go through all of the objects to do uh, some kind of uh, auto-mapping between the objects coming out from the XML into the objects uh, in memory and backward when we do the serialization on the persistent storage. And we also uh, created uh, a kind of resolvers which will allow us and which allow us right now with the new refactored engine to do resolving resolution of uh, uh, types uh, again from the schema to the domain model and back from the domain model to the schema so it, it has a quite a complex architecture it took i think about three months to uh, completely rewrite this engine which was uh, almost rewritten from scratch if compared with the formatter engine but with backward compatibility and last but not least absolutely it is based fully based on community efforts so uh, I worked on it, but for example, another guy from the community, uh, Ivan Wagunin, which deserves a, a big thank you from the community, helped me a lot, and he wrote uh, almost 50% of the serializer. So after we defined the overall architecture and the base class and the base uh, interfaces to implement uh, uh, in the engine, uh, he provided uh, uh, support to write uh, a bunch of serializers together with me. And because, as usual, PMP is is an open source project, you can contribute too. So if you want to improve the quality of code, if you want to contribute in the new refactoring, feel free to, uh, to do that. So uh, let me just show you the uh, refactored engine uh, working, running in my environment, just to show you, just to prove you that uh, I'm not just talking, <laughs> but there is something real and tangible. And so I will switch to my uh, Visual Studio. Here I have a branch which is available in the uh, PMP repository as well, the formatter refactoring branch. So if you want to dig into the details, you can go there and uh, you can already see the full source code of the new refactored uh, engine. And here, just to show you, I have the serializer class for the schema 2016.05. And as you can see, this class is really, really simple because all of the magics are done in the base class. That's why I told you it's fully object-oriented. So we were able and we are able to reuse a bunch of code based on a base class. And whenever we will need to release a new schema version, we will simply need to create a new class with just a few 
uh, information, just a few methods, which are uh, not mandatory, by the way, because as you can see here, it's simply called the base class, which, which means that, for example, these two methods are are not really needed and, and are here just to show you that you can do some overriding of the base class. And then we have a bunch of serializer types here. They are about 24, if I'm not mistaken, which do the serialization, the serialization of every single main object. So for example, you have the one for the ID answer, you have the one for the content types and so on and so forth. Those objects will be invoked in a pipeline based on the deserialization sequence or based on the serialization sequence and related to a minimal supported schema version, as I told you. So here I have a, a fake XML provisioning template with a bunch of information, almost everything in it, because it's, it is the one we use for testing purposes. As you can see, there are fake data like those, but we don't really care about the values of parameters of, uh, or of properties. We simply use this XML file for testing purposes. And here I have a test method which will do the full round trip from the XML file to the memory template and back to the XML file. And here I have the output file which will be rewritten from scratch by the test method. So just let me run this method and I will show you the in-memory template that I will get back from the provide get template method, which is fully back com backward compatible, as I told you. And pretty soon, here we are. It is even faster, I would say, because now we improve the uh, quality of the code. So it is even faster than before. And now in the result object, we have a full provisioning template object with all of the information that were stored in the XML file, like for example, the parameters or the properties or whatever else. And of course, we can use the well-known technique, and we can save it through the provider, the persistent provider of the PMP provisioning engine, we can store this uh, template onto a target file, which will be this one, which will be overwritten. So if I press F5, you will see I have to reload my output file, and here I have the full output still saved as an XML file. So it is fully functional. We are right now code complete, 100% code complete, and we do support all of the information defined in schema 2016.05. So what's next for you uh, guys uh, from a community perspective? Well, just a few things. First of all, we ask you to test it, to play with it, and to let us know, let us know what you think about it. So, until Friday, you will find the source code in the formatter refactoring uh, uh, branch, but pretty soon, uh, just after the master, uh, master merge uh, that will happen on Friday, we will merge the new uh, serialization engine into the dev branch, so you can make a pool and you can play with it. Our plan, as Vesa said, is to release this new engine by May 2017 together with the new schema. So, please, if you have some time, test it, play with it, and let us know what you think, because it's really, really needed to have your feedbacks to finalize and to complete the implementation of this refactored engine. Uh, that's all on my side. I don't know if there are any uh, burning questions in the chat. Beza, have you, have you had a chance no, to skim no, through them? Nothing really, nothing really on, on burning questions on this one. Everybody is just waiting for uh, lookup fields and then additional capabilities of us, uh, which is understandable. Uh, but uh, we need to move uh, step by step. Uh, whenever we get stuff uh, validated and ready, uh, we're able to get it released. Because we do have more than 1,000 tenants using the engine as well. Yeah, of course. So that was my presentation. Uh, if you have any feedback, uh, you can use, uh, again, uh, GitHub and the issues. You can use the chat area or whatever else. Uh, so on my side, I would say thank you and back to you, Visa. Thank you. So let me actually start sharing. I'm going to jump directly to the other demo, which was 10 minutes uh, using a self-service site collection creation uh, uh, with the Flow and Azure and BMP PowerShell. So. Let's actually move on this one. Uh, let's see that the sharing starts and somebody can actually confirm when you can see my screen. Um, seems to show now green. Got it. Excellent. Thank you, Patrick. So what I'm doing here uh, is that I'm going to actually quickly, uh, I'm going to build on something what uh, 
John Liu actually showed uh, two weeks ago as well, uh, related on the Azure functions. But what John didn't actually show is how to do uh, modern theme site provisioning uh, from a UI uh, perspective as well. So uh, kind of a building on, on the similar thinking. I've kind of done, I've done some level of a settings uh, before. So if I go, I created my Azure function uh, app service already. So let me actually go there. Uh, if the Azure is actually letting me to go there, come on. Hello. Uh, what if I click from here and then let's go to the Azure function. And let's actually flip that one, scroll in here. And where's my Azure VESA functions? There we go. So moving into the VESA functions. And dun 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 dun. loading, 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 loading. Dear Asha, there we go. Cool. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to create a new function. Uh, I already have my uh, fully functional version in here, but I'm going to. The story was that how to make this happen in 10 minutes. So let me create a new function. Uh, and in this case, we want to use PowerShell uh, because we want to take advantage uh, of the PMP PowerShell. You could absolutely write C Sharp or uh, JavaScript or whatever. Um, but the PMP PowerShell is quite fast to, for these kind of things as well. The PMP PowerShell uses the PMP system core uh, inside of it. Uh, so you can absolutely do the exact same thing uh, using a managed code as well if needed. So I'm going to do QTrigger PowerShell. Uh, and the reason why I want to do QTrigger rather than HTTP trigger is that I want to actually secure the traffic between the SharePoint Online and my Azure function. If it would be HTTP trigger, it would be an anonymous HTTP endpoint. And essentially, anybody could hit that endpoint. Uh, and that's kind of debatable. Alternative would be timer-based uh, trigger, where I'm like, essentially, for example, scanning a list uh, in a SharePoint site. Uh, and whenever there's a new request which has been approved, and then my PowerShell could actually start doing stuff. Um, or the logic of scanning the site would be in a PowerShell script as well. So but let me do QTrigger PowerShell. And let's create actually uh, this uh, new function. So modern, uh, modern site creation. Uh, and let's, for example, let's, well, samples PowerShell. Let's name this as PMP uh, core SIG. Good, uh, and I'm going to use the storage account connection. I'm going to use my functions. Storage account doesn't really matter uh, as long as you get that information to the other side as well uh, on the SharePoint side or to the flow side. So let's create that. I'm going to actually copy that one to side uh, because I need that information in a second. Now, there's my uh, there's my current implementation, uh, and it actually isn't that. Oh, that's the default uh, template to get started. So uh, I can actually see that I have a one uh, run ps file here. Uh, I can actually do some testing on that one as well. I kind of slightly cheated as well. Uh, the one thing what I cheated was that I'm going to show you this one in practice. I'm going to go to the function app settings uh, and let me actually getting. I'll start that's the dev console. Let me actually do a full screen. So what I've done already uh, is that if, I, if we have a look on this application, um, you can now see two different functions. So this one actually already existed. This is the one which I created, uh, which contains the PS file uh, inside of the, the folder. But how I cheated and saved a few minutes of time is that I have already modules uh, in here. And if you have a look on the John Lewis recording uh, from two weeks ago, and uh, you can actually see uh, why we're doing that. But the whole idea is that in the modules, uh, come on, uh, modules, and if I if I list the stuff, we can actually see that the PMP PowerShell uh, assemblies uh, and also the PSD one file is already uploaded in the modules. The reason why I'm doing this is that I have a centralized shared location uh, for all of my modules. Um, so if I Let's do that. Um, if we have a look on, if I would have a multiple functions, all of them can actually use the same instance of the PMP uh, PowerShell. So that's the only thing which I kind of cheated on this one. So I saved some time. On the other hand, I've been now chatting that much that I lost the time. So modern site creation. So now we have the PMP PowerShell in the Azure. Uh, we want to actually this one get initiated, uh, started uh, whenever an item is added to the store, uh, to the the, the actual queue uh, 
queue in the storage queue. So we have or we have a storage queue name, which is BNB Core Sick Call. We have the storage account connection that's already done. Um, and what we need, what we should be checking, let me do that, uh, is our current Azure Storage Explorer situation. So I'm going to show you this one in practice as well. Dun, 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 dun. So I'm going to quickly connect. I'm going to use the Microsoft Azure Storage Explorer. I should have obviously opened this one already. It's going to connect to here. Uh, there's my function as account, uh, and I can actually see the existing queues in my functions. Uh, right now, it does not have any queues. So let's actually create a one queue for it. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to paste in that queue which I wanted to create. Technically, you can create actually a storage queue uh, from a flow as well. But to avoid uh, avoid things and to show how the things work in practice, I can actually create the queue uh, to the storage account directly. So there's my queue. That's where the requests for new site collection is going to be dropped. Now, the actual development, uh, if I'm using BMP PowerShell, uh, this is super easy. I'm going to slightly cheat. Uh, I'm going to copy paste this one in, but let's have a look on the code. Uh, this isn't that significant amount of code. Uh, so you've seen this one uh, in the past as well within the month oh, within our uh, demos. So what I'm doing is that I'm uploading or importing the module, uh, the SharePoint BMP PowerShell share, uh, online PSD module in. Uh, then I'm actually getting that trigger input essentially what is getting sent uh, from the queue to this uh, Azure function. And then I'm uh, connecting to the Microsoft Graph uh, using the app only model. So I'm using an app ID and an app secret. A secret has been hidden, uh, so you don't, I don't have to change that after this recording. But that is essentially connecting to the Microsoft Graph. And then I'm running the new PMP unified group command. Uh, and with a specific value, so I'm going to use that incoming uh, text as the mail nickname, essentially also the site URL for the new, newly created site. And whenever that is, has been executed, which takes like five seconds, uh, I can actually then, this one will be printed out uh, to the uh, lock window and we can go and have a look on the, is the new site actually created or not. Now, before I actually implement the UI, let's actually test this one in practice. So let's do something like, uh, BMP uh, JS as BMP core sig zero one. And let me actually do this this way so we can actually see that it's actually happening. So there's my test value. Uh, so I don't have to send stuff on the storage queue yet. Uh, I can save and run. And if I explore extend this one, we can say that the function has started. Let me actually do this side by side. And in a second, it should output. Now it's PowerShell script processing started with the queue message of BMP core 601. That's the value there. Now the PowerShell, uh, the Dasher function is connecting to the uh, graph using that command. And then it executes uh, the new BMP unified group. I should probably put an output uh, in here so we'll be able to see how long does it actually take. It takes roughly five to 10 seconds max uh, or 15 seconds to get that site collection or the new group created. And we can actually see that happening live uh, in here as well. So if everything goes fine, not more than five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, okay, 20 seconds maybe, but it's not like minutes, and there we go. And this one, well, we didn't actually see that reflecting there live, uh, but we can already see group created, message coming in here. So if I actually copy that one and to URL, and coming here, let me actually do a quick refresh. Can we see that the group is fine? Maybe this one, this one timed out. Dun, dun, dun. Where's my BMP one? Oh, it's actually in, a, in alphabetical order, so it's probably down there. Um, but if I now take the URL, we can actually see that the site uh, is not quite yet created. Uh, the first time when we hit that URL, uh, it's going to actually um, set up the final settings on the site. And then we can actually access the site based on the uh, ID. So the group does exist at this point, and there's our site uh, which has which is using the title with the BMP Core 01. So essentially, this way, uh, I can see that my code is working already properly. I can test it in here. And now it's a matter of okay, I want to implement that UI in the flow as well.
So let's actually flip on the flow. Let me quickly do that. So this one is now uh, ready. So essentially our script doesn't look too bad. One, two, three, four, five, six lines of code from which two are outputs and one is import. So actually we have two lines of code. Not too bad, or two lines of PowerShell script. Uh, and you can absolutely test this in your local box before you use it and uh, move, it, uh, move it into the Azure functions. So now we want to actually create a UI for this one. So let's actually create a simplistic UI. So I'm going to go to the team site. Um, and what I'm going to do is that I'm not, nothing fancy. I'm going to just create a new list, uh, modern list. Let's call this uh, site request, create the list. And then uh, let's create a flow for this list. So from flow, uh, create a flows, or create flow. Uh, there's quite a lot of templates available on flow, but I'm actually want to build a one uh, by myself. So I'm going to move into my flow. And let's create a, a flow from Plank. I'm not interested on any templates for this one. And what we want to do is that we want to actually check when SharePoint uh, a new item is created to a SharePoint list. And this one is asking uh, the URL and the list name. So let me actually go in here. I'm going to copy the URL so I get it right. And let's go back to flow. There we go. It is connecting to the site. Good. And then I can actually use the drop down to uh, select my site requests list. And then, uh, OK, new item is created to the list. And then we want to add an action. So what's going to happen when a new item is getting to the list? And we're actually interested on a queue messages. So I'm going to uh, put a message on a queue. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, and a queue to boot message to is PMP core sick call. Somehow magically it was able to find that. Uh, and that's because my, I have my Azure connection already done to this function storage queue. So I was able to see that queue or directly in the, in the storage queues. And what I'm going to add there in the queue, uh, from a simplicity perspective, this is as simple, simplistic demo as it gets, I'm going to add a title. So the title would be then the URL of the site which is getting created. I could absolutely make this more complex. I would be able to then split the strings in the PowerShell side on the Azure Functions side, get additional information and parsing the strings and all of that. But for my sake of, of demo, let's actually do that, just this one. So let's save that. That's done. Flow has been created. Uh, Let's click Done. We're all good to go. I'm going to flip back on my site. Let's do side by side so we can actually see this one in practice. Uh, how do I get rid of that flow? How do I get rid of that? X. There we go. So now if I create a new item to this list, let's call this uh, BNP Core Sick uh, 100. So we can actually differentiate that from the list. Save. And now the flow actually starts. And in a second, if we have a look on here, we should be able to see that queue message is getting passed into the storage queue. And uh, the storage queue uh, is initiating, well, other way around, probably. The Azure function is actually realizing, hey, there's an item in the queue. Now it starts uh, executing that function. We can see that there's a PowerShell script processing started uh, with the queue message of BMP SIG 100. Now we need to wait that few, few more seconds. To make that actually happen. Come on, come on, a few more seconds, a few more seconds, a few more seconds. And obviously, I could just as well extend right now, like mentioned, we have here one and two lines of actually BMP PowerShell. Um, I can actually add whatever PowerShell here. I could actually uh, send an email, to, uh, do a notification, um, uh, whatever is need needed to be done, um, do modifications on the site, uh, and all of that as well. So now the group has been created. Uh, and now if I take the URL, which I just formatted on the right format, uh, and get into the back in here, let's request that one. 
there is a small delay uh, on on the creation of that, and we can modify that slightly. We could use actually REST APIs to get the site created faster. Uh, but there's my site now getting created. There's no customizations within the site, but hey, there's a few members in a site uh, added based on the, the configuration over there. We can say that it's the BMP Core Stick 100, uh, and it's actually got created. So now. Basically, within 10 minutes, uh, if you know where to click, uh, you can actually create a self-service site collection creation flow. Not a production ready, but already a great start to start evolving uh, the capabilities. Uh, and there's a good comment from Paul. Uh, so uh, there's a timeout uh, in Azure, which is five minutes. Uh, so if the processing takes longer than five minutes, uh, you want to actually uh, do multiple functions, uh, or you might call another, uh, or you might delegate uh, the customization to an Azure web job, or there's multiple different options how to do that. Um, but basic flow uh, is super, super fast. Uh, so, and super, super smooth uh, from that perspective. It really depends on what kind of customizations we would be then applying on that side. Good. So the practice piece could be, yes, uh, just quickly scanning through the documents. Uh, what's the cost for doing this? So uh, the cost for Azure Functions is super, super low. Uh, so we talked about that one two weeks ago. The difference for doing this comparing to the Azure Web Job is, is really, really big. Uh, so this is super, super cheap uh, comparing Azure Web Job. Azure Web Jobs are not expensive either. Uh, but Azure Functions, at least for now, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I have no idea. Uh, but they're super, super cheap. This is like 0 0.001 cents uh, to, to do this. So super fast. Um, good. Not, nothing that many uh, questions on there. Uh, and this would be a great thing, no doubt, for somebody to, or maybe to me, write down uh, and copy paste the code and explain everybody how to make this happen. Maybe do a video recording. Wait, wait, we actually did that within this call, getting this one recorded. So, flipping back on the slides, um, uh, just to close up and, and do some Q&A if there's any, any questions. So, that's our latest slide here. Yes, I could absolutely get rid of all of the delays. There was such a significant amount of delays on this one, <laughs> like a few seconds here and there. Um, I can see from a timing checks, uh, da, 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 da. for example, the last, uh, yeah, it was like 30 seconds to get a new site collection created. Not too bad, actually. A new modern site collection uh, with the custom uh, permissions in 30 seconds. That's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so pretty simplistic UI, pretty simplistic functionality, uh, just to show the power of flow as well. Um, and I think, uh, and obviously I should be pointing out, the PMP, uh, sorry, the PowerShell support in Azure Functions is in preview. The, the queue handling in the flow is in preview, so they're not actually GA ready uh, yet, um, but they will be relatively soon. I don't actually have even timelines, even though probably would not be able to share them. Um, but obviously, they, they will be heading to the GA at some point. And then that simplifies development. Uh, someone, it's, it's debatable. Do you want to actually do your customizations or provisioning using PowerShell, or do you want to do that using code? Um, there's advantages and disadvantages in both options. Uh, you could write, let's say, a provider-hosted uh, provider hosted adding to work as your UI for creating site collections. You add an item to the storage queue, and then uh, the actual provisioning is done from Azure, uh, Azure Functions. That could be a one option. And uh, there is the timeout uh, challenge for that one as well. Uh, good. <laughs> uh, that's a good point from Bill Ayers. Five minute timeout only applies to consumption plan. Um, okay, let's actually double check that one. Uh, that's actually a really, really good comment uh, because when Maybe I should write a small blog post or some, whenever somebody writes a small blog post on that one, I uh, should double check uh, the five minute timeout. Good. Uh, any questions, comments, feedback? We have two minutes.
no comments. So this is why we need to pin down the practice for it. Yeah? What would be the use case to use Azure Functions over Remote Event Receivers? Um, it's debatable. Uh, so the Remote Event Receivers work well uh, if you are using an, uh, an add-in to register them. Um, Azure Functions are completely technology independent. Um, so Remote Event Receivers does require that you're using WCF endpoints, uh, that you're using .NET as your backend. Uh, the Remote Event Receivers, to be able to get the context to your Remote Event Receivers, you need to register the Remote Event Receiver as an add-in. Uh, using this kind of a model, uh, you're kind of delegating the whole thing. It's more loosely coupled implementation. Um, what's the best practice? There's no such thing as best practices. It always depends on the on the objectives of the of the uh, project. Uh, remote event receivers, absolutely valid case. Maybe future web jobs. Uh, sorry, not web jobs. Sorry, web hooks. Um, you can use storage queues. Uh, now, if you wanna, if you want to have a simplistic way of, uh, let's say, maintaining your provisioning uh, from a functionality perspective. Uh, Azure Functions and PowerShell scripts. Yeah, absolutely works as well. Uh, if that's the way you want to actually go. It, it is again debatable. It really depends what's the maintenance plan, what is the overall architecture of the design. That's why personally I've never said that something should be and would be a best practice because best, best practices do not exist. We should not be those of black and white on things. Um, any other questions, comments? Um, Dun, 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 dun. No, we're hitting the hour. I think it's time to close up. Uh, thank you for joining on this one. Hopefully the demo was interesting, uh, and hopefully the stuff was uh, the demos and content was interesting as well. We will have a uh, following master match coming on this Friday. Uh, so uh, on is it eighth? No, Friday is seventh uh, of April, and then we'll start working on the provisioning schema updates after that. Um, but thank you for joining. Thank you, and we'll see you in next time. And please give us input using the GitHub and tech communities and everything else. Thank you. Bye-bye.